Hi, I'm Tatiana Darabidisian, Business Development Manager of the World Ocean Initiative, and welcome to this World Ocean Summit's strategy session on shipping. Sponsored by Willenius Wilhansen, we will be discussing beyond technology, what is required to enable the adoption of near zero emission vessels. I am joined today by four distinguished and experienced panelists, Craig Yashinsky, Group Chief Executive of Willenius Wilhelmsen, who you will have heard from in the previous session, Adair Turner, Chair of the Energy Transitions Commission, Magda Kopczynska, Director for Waterborne Transport at DG Move in the European Commission, and Roran Noach, Vice President Worldwide Logistics, CNH. You can find the full biographies of our panelists on the screen under this media player. Adair, we're setting ambitious targets and goals. How can the efforts of high-level initiatives trickle down to enable the fulfillment of practical initiatives? Well, let me, in attempting to answer that, say a few words about what I think is the nature of the challenge in shipping as distinct from the other sectors which in the Energy Transition Commission uh, we deal with. Because I think it's always important to try and work out, is there a technological challenge is there a cost challenge or is the coordination challenge? And broadly speaking, in the long term in shipping, there isn't a cost challenge because ship freight costs are such a small part of the end consumer cost of the products that consumers buy that it doesn't matter if the best way to decarbonize global shipping is quite expensive. Um, even if freight costs had to go up by 100% to get us to a zero carbon solution, that would do a trivial increase uh, to the cost of a kilo of sugar or a pair of jeans and an even more trivial impact on the cost of an iPhone move from Pearl River Delta to Europe. The end consumer premium, the green consumer premium of decarbonizing shipping is going to be very small. It's also true that the technologies are available. Uh, we know in principle that you could run uh, ships on either methanol or ammonia. They're probably the two major technologies we're talking about. I don't think we've got any doubt that those are feasible technologies. We suspect that both of them would involve a significant increase in the fuel cost, at least for a couple of decades, but it's technologically possible for us to head towards zero carbon uh, shipping. And even if there's some extra cost, provided uh, we can uh, get that to be applied equally across all competitors, frankly, it doesn't matter uh, to the global economy that there are some extra cost. And what that defines for me is that the ultimate problem with shipping is the complexity of the coordination challenge. This is an industry with multiple players involved in the value chain, from marine fuel producers, uh, uh, bunkering suppliers, vessel operators, vessel owners, cargo owners. It is also inherently international. So I think the fundamental challenge we have is how to coordinate this industry to all move together to solve some of these problems. The fact that it's technologically and economically feasible to get to net zero is why companies such as Maersk have been willing to make net zero by 2050 commitments. But it's essentially about how do we get all the aspects of the industry to work together. And in an ETC report that we produced for the global getting to zero coalition, it was called the first wave, we've tried to set out how you get going, how, for instance, on a particular deep sea route, who has to do what in terms of uh, getting the uh, engines available that can burn uh, either methanol or ammonia, but even more important, uh, getting the port handling facilities, and probably even more important for that, and let me finish on this, what is really interesting in terms of the economic challenge here, the actual costs of what you have to do within the ship will probably be a small part of the challenge. The really big challenge will be how do we develop green ammonia or green methanol and behind that green hydrogen 
on the pace required in order to drive the decarbonization of this industry. So that's my thoughts on how we go beyond the fact that the technology is possible to the particular set of problems that we have to solve uh, in order to implement this transition. Thank you. I mean, Magda, the European Union aims to be climate neutral by 2050 and, and cut its CO2 emissions by 55% by 2030. So where does shipping fit into these ambitious objectives and is the industry on board to contribute? Um, thank you, Tatiana, for the question. I'm really inclined to come in and immediately reply to some of the things that Adair has just said, but I will start with my question and I'm sure we'll have chances to get into discussion later in the, in the, in the panel. We have one hour, plenty of time for that. Um, indeed, the target of carbon uh, neut neutrality in, in 2050 uh, is something that uh, President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, put on the table the moment uh, she got into into, into her current job. And this target has been wholeheartedly supported at all political levels by, by all EU member states. What was very interesting was that from the first moment, uh, she was saying with a target that is as ambitious, all sectors have to contribute, which means also shipping. That has been quite, quite a strong statement because it's uh, recognized that for an international sector like shipping, EU has to be very smart how we come up with a framework that pushes shipping in the right direction and that will also work in sync with whatever will be happening at the at the international level in addition to this to this uh, neutral carbon neutrality a target of 2050 with the climate target plan of September uh, 2020 we committed to minus 55% of greenhouse gas emissions reduction in 2030. What is very important, though, it is clear that not all sectors will be able to reach minus 55% reduction by 2030. That will need to go in different pace for different sectors of economy, which is why what, what, what we are working on at the moment is what we sometimes call a basket of measures uh, looking across the entire European economy, checking which sectors will go at which pace so that in 2030 we do meet with this minus 55% reduction. For shipping, those targets are lower. And for shipping, I think what, what has changed in, in the last couple of years, obviously we have been in, 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 in dialogue with the sector, but to a great extent, thanks to the agreement at the I, for the IMO global uh, strategy, there's an agreement in the shipping sector that they have to deliver, where we still, mm -hmm discuss and I think we'll continue to discuss is what exactly will happen in which part of the shipping supply chain at, at large, what will happen first in which part of the world, because it's not only the EU that is pushing ahead, it's also other parts of, of the world uh, with China, with US, with California, that look at what can be done to speed up the transition in shipping. As I said, I, I would, I, I'm not going to react right now, but I think this question whether technology is really there and how quickly uh, or how far reaching the technological transition can be already now is something that maybe we'll have a chance to, to discuss a bit more uh, later. But I'll stop here also to allow everybody else for the introductory comments. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. So it sounds like you're a little bit um, dubious about the the reality of of this as um, of happening as easily as as Adair sort of um, highlighted in the beginning. I guess, uh, Dora, I want to bring you into this and, and ask you how important is sustainability for CNH and and how is your organisation reducing its emissions while also supporting the shipping industry's efforts to achieve their targets? For CNH industrial, sustainability is part of our DNA. Uh, we've just been reconfirmed the 10th year in a row as uh, the leading industrial part of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Uh, so it's clear, very clear, it's very important. CNH is a industrial, is a very, very large corporation, and we break the activities and the action for each one of the function, whether it's manufacturing, distribution, engineering, 
each one take, takes a part in in their part of uh, sustainability. And then we go and we audit, confirm, uh, and, and, and seek many, many, many ideas. So whether it's working in a clean way, cleaning the water, reducing, uh, reducing waste, uh, using a solar panel, and so on and so forth. And in my area of responsibility, which is transportation and logistics, we are very, very ac active on all the normal inbound, outbound flows. How do you to, to take many, many actions in order to reduce sustainability? And the way we do it is whether it's cubing more into each trailer, whether it's finding multimodal solution of distribution, working with the companies and organization like WWL, who are, are very, very much in the forefront of the Finnish good distribution uh, sustainability objectives. Sustainability can be achieved with your current infrastructure up to a certain level. You know, there's so much you can do multimodal, there's so much you can do rail, there's so much you can do all the normal stuff that we've been doing, and we are really looking forward for the, the incredible breakthrough that WWL is leading here, is using new technologies to have a very, very aggressive uh, target. So, so we are we are super excited uh, with this project. Thank you. Actually, uh, Craig, uh, Wilenius um, has just announced your new project, the Also Wind Concept Development Initiative. Um, this is a, a bold new Roro vessel design that is primarily wind powered and projected to achieve um, emission reductions of up to ninety percent relative to today's best vessels. So. If you build it, will they come? And they being the customers. Is there a choice? I, I think uh, is, is really fundamentally our perspective. And, and actually, I, I, I'm going to touch upon some of the things that Lord Turner said as well in terms of um, what are the true challenges that we're facing to, to achieve what we need to achieve. But, but just to wind back to your question, quite simply, we, we don't have a choice. And as Magda touched upon, as a shipping industry, we're representing, this is our interesting paradox as an industry, we're representing nearly 3% of world CO2 emissions, which is not a, I'm not saying that with pride, I'm saying that to, to call it out and say that's what it is on one hand. On the other hand, and this is our paradox, the actual carbon intensity per kilometer mile yeah. is the most efficient form of transportation or some of the most efficient forms of transportation. So that's the paradox uh, that we live with. So we have, I believe, and we believe in Molinius Willemson, an enormous responsibility uh, to work as hard as we can to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, Magda, you talked about IMO's targets, which, which we embrace. Uh, from our perspective, they should be more aggressive. Uh, what you're suggesting in, within the EU Commission um, is also important to continue to push the shipping industry and the maritime industry to find the solutions that we need to find. Uh, to Lord Turner's point, uh, technology is available. There are types of fuel available. The immediate challenge we face, as far as I can see, is, is kind of twofold. The first and foremost, the energy demand to push one of our ships through the water in the course of a 24-hour period is 400 kilowatt hours. It's enough energy that's required to power 40,000 households in the same time frame. That's just one of our ships, and we have 120 plus minus at any given time. So the energy demand we have as an industry is absolutely enormous. Uh, on the basis that we can access low carbon or carbon-free fuels, I'm going to come back to all cell wind in a very second in a second, but the fact that we can access or the belief that we can access the quantity of fuels that we require at whatever the cost will be uh, are the steps that the industry has to take. If I wind back to Orcel Wind, which was uh, also uh, Draw's reference, yes, extremely proud on Wednesday we, we've launched the, uh, the first full-scale wind-powered 7,000-unit car carrier uh, to the industry, which is also suited to, uh, to lift the type of product that uh, Draw and his organization represent, undoubtedly. Uh, but that's a vessel that's going to offer us up to 90% reduction in emissions. Do we believe that we can replace our entire fleet operating globally with this type of vessel? No, we don't. But we have to be courageous. We have to make a step. 
And if we can build one of these or five of them or 10, every single one of them is going to help us on that journey to reduce emissions. Uh, and I'm going to take, I'm, I'm still a bit of time, Tatiana, here to also refer back to something Lord Turner said. The impact in the supply chain, the true cost, what's, what's something that I think we also have to just recognise and realise and, and draw our I'll be very kind here and, and refer more to the automotive industry than the heavy equipment industry. But the actual cost of CPAM transportation on average from one port on one side of the world to another is marginally less in total cost in what we charge than what the typical dealer gives in discounts at the very first sales call inside the dealership. So to your point, Lord Turner, the, the actual impact of the freight cost on the finished product is marginal. And if it's going to cost us with this wind-powered vessel, now we've not priced it yet, but uh, I, I'm going to, to put some numbers that are, are not there to be confirmed, but it's just an example. If it's going to cost us 20 to 30% more to build that ship, if we have to expand the time in the supply chain by four to five days uh, over instead of 10, so increasing the transit time by 30 or 40 percent, surely the inventory can bear it and surely the consumer can cover that cost. Thank you for that. I guess, um, I don't know, Dave, you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back on that and agree with that. Look, first of all, I think it's interesting to think about the technologies available to decarbonize shipping. And there are a range of them which will apply at different distances and sizes. I think at the shorter difference level, at the, uh, the, the RORO, the cross-channel ferries, the cross-fjord ferries, the sort of stuff that Stenaline does from uh, UK to Ireland, or now, sadly, it's Ireland to France because you're trying to uh, uh, ignore uh, my funny little country. Um, a, uh, those, I think there's going to be a significant role for pure electric, uh, for hydrogen, for hydrogen fuel cell. Um, I think the thing that Craig just mentioned uh, about a, uh, a sail, sail assist is, is really exciting. But I think however much of that we do, we still think that for the really long distance container ships and bulks, we will eventually be trying to create a new form of fuel which can be burned in fundamentally not dramatically different engines than at the moment. And indeed, uh, as I think we all know, the major uh, engine manufacturers, uh, Watzler and, and MAN, are saying that within just three or four years, they will be able to make uh, dual-use uh, diesel and methanol uh, engines or dual-use diesel and ammonia engines, which then can become over time 100% ammonia or 100% methanol. And that's what I meant when I said that the thing that has to happen in the ship, um, actually, we sort of know that it's technologically possible and it's not that far away. I think Craig focused on the really crucial issue, which is in order to drive those ships with a new fuel, you need a lot of ammonia or a lot of methanol, which means a lot of hydrogen, which means a lot of electricity. And it's why a lot of our focus on the Energy Transition Commission now is not simply on what is technologically possible in the South, but are policymakers aware of just the scale of zero carbon electricity to produce zero carbon hydrogen, to produce zero carbon shipping fuel, which is going to be needed to support this, and the scale of the handling facilities required, and also the scale of the decarbonization of electricity. Remember that once you have the efficiency losses in making your hydrogen and making your ammonia, the electricity that you start with has got to be below about 120 grams per kilowatt hour of production of the electricity, or you'd have been better off keeping going with the diesel fuel. So you've got to have behind this a very strong plan for how we deliver very much larger quantities of electricity in all our systems and hydrogen and ammonia in the ports and in the locations required in a zero carbon fashion. And that's why I think we need to make sure that we've got an adequate focus on that, as well as on the things in the shipping industry themselves, where I think the, the issue of the actual, the engines, uh, I suspect is going to be something which the industry itself has solutions to available pretty quickly. Magda, um, do, you want to, do you want to add anything to this? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I do not fundamentally uh, disagree with uh, what Lord Turner just said, but I think it's a question of um, testing various technologies, as you said, uh, at various uh, types of sh of shipping um, shipping trade, if I may call it like that. It's a question of availability of those zero emission uh, energy sources, be it methane, ammonia, then hydrogen, uh, both to produce them, but maybe also hydrogen as a, as a, as a, as a source of, of energy for the vessel. But it's also a question of how quickly that amount can be made available and what we are going to do to make sure that uh, we have that transition happening across the entire sector where vessels remain in operations for 2025 years and i think that's that's the real challenge to have a predictable regulatory pathway that allows uh, industry, shipping industry, to plan and to know what ships they will need to have available in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And then in addition to that, we do need this entire uh, landscape. We need to have uh, diff well, zero emission fuels supplied available not just in one port, but in ports worldwide. We need to make sure that uh, ports operations fit. And we also need to um, account for a possibility that if there are breakthrough technologies, that they can also find their space in, in, in the entire shipping universe and that those who will come up with those breakthrough technologies, they will, be, they will be recognized and they will be awarded. I think one challenge that all regulators have when they are coming, when they are trying to regulate something that is not known, when we have a sector where we are departing from the beautiful situation when we had one type of fuel, across the entire sector, now we are looking at very different types of fuels, some of them unknown, many of them untested yet for safety applications in the shipping sector, that we need to have a way where those who are more courageous, who are more forward-looking, who come up with solutions that are on the margin of being of being um, uh, pure innovation that their efforts and their investments are also recognized and i think from, from the point of view of a regulator this this is the biggest challenge how much to push and how much to pull and how quickly can we put forward requirements which uh, must be challenging but must not be overtly challenging or overtly stringent thank you thank you Thank you, Magda, because I was actually going to ask you about um, should the focus be on funding um, and supporting innovation or implementing more regulation, but it sounds like you're suggesting the two go hand in hand. Um, Craig, uh, I, you had your hand up, so I don't know if you want to add anything further. Yeah, I, I think we're just into two very interesting areas, both from a regulatory perspective and, and actually back to capital expenditure and, and, and the engine. Um, but just to address what you were talking about there, Magda, I think uh, yeah, a stable regulatory environment is for the shipping industry. Uh, it's it's absolutely critical, and one of the challenges that we uh, we 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 foresee and and we need to work very hard to avoid is that we don't end up with variations of of um, regional regula regulations, because as a global operator such as ourselves or or Maersk, uh, we we're in every single continent, every corner of the globe, so it's hard to. To adopt yourself to pure regional regulatory uh, re requirements, so we need to have some type of framework which is uh, it can be applicable across the globe, across all uh, um, regions. But there's room for regional interpretation or adaptation for the specifics of that region. I think that that can make sense, but we need something that's that's giving us some stability um, and, and market-based measures. Uh, as far yeah. as we're concerned, become very important here as well. Because, and you said it, I think, perfectly, Magda, those that are bold enough um, to step forward and try something new that actually invest heavily in this arena as we do, uh, we can't have um, measures or taxes or, or, or regulations coming in which punish those that were early movers and have invested and reward those who haven't done very much at all. 
and and as far as I'm concerned, the uh, and we are concerned in Wallonia's Williamson, the the one size fits all discussion that we should just reduce the fleet, the speed of the global fleet. Uh, it's not that simple. Yes, that definitely has a positive carbon impact, no question, but it will reward those that operate slow, older capacity and punish those that have built uh, faster, more energy efficient vessels such, such as ourselves. So that's, you know, that's a challenge in itself. So getting these market-based measures even for the industry and not to punish the, the early movers and the investors, I think is important. Back to, uh, I know there's lots of hands up and I, I don't want to steal all the time, but just quickly back to engines. And, and I think we're into a very interesting point there as well. Uh, let's assume, let's assume the fuel, uh, the availability of the fuel that we need is solved. So we're able to provide the energy, the, the electricity that's needed to produce those fuels in an in environmentally friendly way. So we can go from well to wake, if I can use that term, or at least to the vessel with a fuel which, which is sound and makes sense. If that's available in the next three to five years, uh, a carrier such as ourselves, we, we build ships for 30 years. Yeah. So we'll, have, we'll be facing a couple of options. Every new vessel we build, of course, we can put in a new engine type. But to retrofit an existing vessel, which may have another 25 years or 28 years left of economic life, uh, what's that hurdle to replace that main engine from a capital expenditure perspective? And that can be massive. Uh, because the, the ship is quite simply mm. built around the engine uh, because of the way it's constructed. So it's also not as simple as it, assuming the fuels are available, we can't just shift the engines out. It's not that simple. It's going to require massive amounts of capital. So where would that funding come from? Uh, now, we would encourage it strongly if it were possible, but uh, it would be a tremendous burden on the shipping industry. So how would we fund that, I think, is an important aspect of that. Thank you. Draw, do you have any other comments to add? Yeah, I, I, I support what Greg is saying. And I think what we need to have is after we have the technology available, proved and working, then we need with regulation to give support to the people who drives the innovation. And that means that they will be able to be more competitive. You cannot have the same routing of a vessel that one will go with uh, 20 plus knots and the other one will go at 10 knots and it's just not going to be competitive. It's not going to be, there's not going to be any incentive to the people who have the faster, more polluting vessel to go and spend the time, energy and money to come and, and, and be more sustainable. So we need to help them to be more sustainable and slowly, slowly transition the industry to 100% sustainable uh, shipping. It is not an over. In my opinion, it is not an overnight uh, solution. It's going to take some time, but we need first to see that we have one, two, three technologies that are proved, that are working, and then we see how we how we deploy them in a balanced way by rewarding the people who are in the forefront of those technologies. So, I mean. Um... And I'll let, um, I'll let maybe Adair answer this question, but in a globalized economy, uh, for an economy, it, that, that is feasible. But for developing countries, that might be um, quite challenging, especially from a regulatory perspective. So I don't know whether, Magda or Adair, you want to sort of um, maybe chat, add something or sort of talk a little bit about that? Could I just comment on this issue of pace? And it's a point that Magda made this, to start with when she was saying, the European Union is aiming for a 55% reduction by 2030, some sectors faster than others, and link it to the, the points that Craig has made and also Drew. Um, I think we all accept that the shipping industry cannot make as much progress in the 2020s as, for instance, the electricity system does. Fundamentally, I think we should be aiming for all rich developed economies to get their entire electricity systems to zero carbon by about 2035. We need to do that to make sure that the electricity we're then putting into other new applications is sufficiently low carbon uh, that um, uh, we truly are reducing emissions. So electricity has to lead the way. Shipping does have this challenge of long lasting assets. And so I think all of the scenarios for shipping show essentially 
at the beginning of changes in the 2020s, and then it's from 2030 onwards that we expect a big wedge of the increasing move uh, towards uh, zero carbon uh, fuels, whether it be methanol, whether it be um, uh, uh, ammonia, uh, whether it be electricity or hydrogen at shorter distances, uh, whatever. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what we need to make sure is that enough is happening in the 2020s, in the technological development, in the early development of enough scale, uh, both in the technologies of the ships themselves, but also crucially, uh, as we talked about before, in that hydrogen supply. So the, the EU and other strategies around the world to develop cheap hydrogen supplies by driving the development of electrolyzers and driving down the cost of electrolyzers, that is relevant to the steel sector, it's relevant to the trucking sector, it's relevant to the shipping sector, it's a crucial underpin uh, for everything else. Uh, as for the global issue, I think we, you do need to keep coming back to the role of the IMO here. I mean, ultimately, shipping is an international uh, business. The vast majority of our emissions are international, uh, not uh, domestic. And therefore, we do need to find some way of creating a level playing field. Now, the good news is that we have two sectors in the world, aviation and shipping, which have international law lawmaking power. They can actually say by majority vote, this is how it's going to be. Uh, now you have to do it. They can say you're not allowed uh, you know, high sulfur uh, fuels and that has to apply throughout the world. So this is a huge advantage. I think the IMO took a big step forward with the 50% reduction. I actually think this should be a 100% reduction. I think the global shipping industry should be aiming for net zero by 2050. I think this is a crucial thing that we need attention on at COP26, that in a, alongside focusing on national NDCs, which relate to things that happen in countries, the two big uh, international sectors, IMO, uh, uh, aviation and shipping, also need an approach. And I think within that, we will have to underpin all the good work which is being done by the sector, by individual companies, we will eventually need either some form of carbon tax on the diesel fuel to create a advantage for everybody else who is doing whatever the other opportunity is, because that makes it that makes it technology neutral. You, you, you're, you're not subsidizing one new thing, you are hitting and disincentivizing the old high carbon thing, or it's a fuel duty mandate, a requirement of a percentage of total fuel use uh, that has to be zero carbon. That's somewhat more administratively difficult. But I do think that there are a whole load of things that the industry can do itself. And I think the forward looking people in the industry are getting to the grips with it. There are good things that individual countries are going to do. But we mustn't understate the importance in an inherently uh, international industry of the IMO as the uh, as the global regulator. Magda, what are your thoughts on on the global regulator's role? Um, yes. a, a, a question a question we we and I have always often been asked: uh, how, What is a global and regional approach? And as the history of uh, regulatory framework in shipping shows, uh, sometimes IMO comes first. I'd like to recall that on the low sulfur regulatory framework, actually it was at the IMO uh, that the thing started in 2008 when MARPOL uh, 6 was, was uh, updated. But sometimes um, being a very complex international body, IMO needs a little nudge. And that's oh, yeah. actually how we've been looking uh, at what we've been pushing for at the EU level. At the same time, we always talk. We're always talking with international partners. We're always talking to, to people who, who, who lead on discussions in the IMO. Some of those are easier. Some of those are more complicated. But but I liked what, what I heard about the IMO strategy. 2023 is the year when the uh, 2018 IMO strategy strategy is up for revision. Yeah. I said it often to, to, to representatives of the shipping sector, I just don't imagine 
a situation that this revision of the strategy can be in any other direction than more ambitious. The question is, how much more ambitious? And it's so interesting because now we take this 50% for granted. We say it's not enough. It should be more. But we are 2021. In, w- when the strategy was being agreed at IMO, it was not so obvious. And it actually shows how much has changed in the approach to decarbonization across the entire shipping industry. And if I were to, to name like one thing that gives me the most hope in achieving the ambitious target, it's exactly that. Nobody is questioning now anymore, anywhere, that the sector has to decarbonize. It's a question how fast were the question of technologies, you know, whether 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 it's only through financial instruments, market-based measure, or whether it's through support to to, to deployment of clean technologies, who will support uh, RNI to make sure that those technologies are there and that they have been tested in a sufficiently robust manner so that in 2030, because they are ready for the market uptake. Because I think we, we, we will all agree 2030 is a bit that year that if we don't have zero emission technologies ready for a wide market uptake in shipping, then we'll never make it for whatever targets we want to have in 2050. Because with the, with the, with the gradual replacement of shipping fleet, we need to know where we are going and what we what will be the uh, sailing on seas and oceans worldwide in 2030 because we need the entire uh, framework to be ready. We need to have ports ready, fuel infrastructure. We need to know uh, which type of fuels where, which ships, and so on and so forth. We need to have the shipbuilding uh, part of the of the solution also in place, which is why, indeed, I completely agree. What's going to happen in in the 10 years we are just starting, is extremely important. At the, at the EU level, we are now putting uh, in place or basically launching literally in the next couple of weeks a waterborne partnership that will be looking only at research and innovation to make sure that those zero emission technologies are ready for the market in 2030 for shipping. And I, I, I have high hopes because we have everybody there from research institutions to ship owners to ports uh, to construction companies to engine providers everybody is there with very very singular objective and the fact that we actually managed to put and pull everybody together and to agree that this is where we are heading is actually again another very very optimistic um, optimistic factor for me Coming back to the question about the about the global dimension, I think indeed the, the IMO process is the one that should be giving us reassurance that in terms of, of interests and requirements from uh, the developing countries, those needs uh, and, and expectations are taken on board. And that is why also, you know, we do know that some regions of the world will go faster, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that ultimately the entire sector will not catch up. Thank you. Thank you. I want to. I want to go beyond technology. I want to um, draw. I want to sort of bring you into this and, and ask you. You know, uh, most freight contracts last two to four years, um, and zero emission vessels may require longer term commitment. What are your thoughts on overcoming um, those obstacles? Working with the right partners that can give us the right solutions going forward. This is not a short thing. Actually, our some of our agreements are much, much longer than, than the period that you mentioned. We go five, we go seven years. There's a strategic partnership. And if you trust your partners, uh, you, you, you will get the right solutions in place. So, so I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that, as Craig said earlier, at the moment that we'll build them, they will come. And yes, we will use the vessels and we will push. Uh, from all, with all the companies we work with, because we work with, with almost all the shipping lines worldwide in different capacities, whether it's containers, whether it's raw, raw uh, we will push and, and motivate uh, to drive sustainability forward. Regardless of the contract, the contract is not, a, the, contract is not the bottleneck here. Craig. Yeah, thanks, Tatania. I think... Um, uh, particularly what draws reflecting upon there and and uh, is a very good example of the partnership we have in in that we both organizations have the same commitments to drive a change uh, 
one thing that I'm perhaps asking you a question, Laura, but uh, a conversation around, but what is it going to take us in the supply chain? So what changes do we need to make in, in the way we, uh, we look at the whole value chain of a vehicle, irrespective of what a vehicle may be? And now I'm obviously focusing on the railroad sector. Uh, but there's areas there where, where we, as, as industry operators and players, we see the need to work together, hand in hand together with yourselves and manufacturers. Are there ways or are there needs to rethink some of the KPIs in the supply chain? You know, we typically today, we're, we're all tested on price, quality and speed, which, is, which was a, a logical set of criteria for a supply chain. But when, when do we bring in that fourth dimension? When do we bring sustainability in to the decision-making processes? And when do we bring sustainability in as that fourth dimension to driving change in the supply chain? Uh, how, do we, how do we find ways to, to move away from meeting wholesale targets and rushing product to meet a wholesale target only to see it sit in inventory for longer periods of time? Now, that's a generic perspective. It's not, not relevant to any specific manufacturer, but it is a a generic perspective that we certainly experience uh, in, in our role in the industry. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more from Draw on that. I, I, I would love to comment back on what we talked about with IMO. Um, and I think I have to, actually, because I just want to close on point. And I, I think uh, we're absolutely right. I think Magda and, and Lord Tony, you're spot on. We, we need IMO to set the pace. Uh, we embrace a, a more aggressive target from IMO. Uh, I like your point, Magda. They need a little nudge from time to time, and and uh, we 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 totally agree. And um, at the end of the day, isn't progress dependent on the unreasonable person? And and that is the challenge of IMO. I think is such a large group of nations that represent themselves in IMO. Uh, what will hold us back is, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say the, the unreasonable party or the lowest common denominator is what holds us back. Uh, that needs to change. And we should certainly encourage IMO to push this industry. The only reason why we see considerably more electric vehicles on the road in Europe today is because it was regulated. If it wasn't regulated, would they have come naturally? Not so sure. Um, so we need regulation to to drive a change. So I had to comment. So, but back to the question, Joel, um, what, what you and I talk about on a consistent basis is how do we work together to resolve the challenges in the supply chain uh, to improve sustainability? I think what you mentioned on the on the first part of what's the fourth dimension KPI uh, that we're measuring on sustainability on the different shipping lines worldwide, I think the day that there will be a significant substantiation between one to the other that can be clearly measured uh, and, and, and put one ahead of the other, it will be much easier uh, to discuss because today most shipping lines are following the same regulation. Uh, and and there isn't a real, real breakthrough that we can see and measure today uh, between in the industry. As far as supply chain, I fully agree with you. We need to rethink the supply chain. We need to redesign the supply chain, which is, which is not very difficult. I mean, you just set what are the new KPIs of the new more sustainable services. You still push to achieve end of month, end of quarter, end of year, because you will design the supply chain around your end customer needs. And, and we need to remember that the customer, on one hand, is king, but we are all working to satisfy our customer, but we all have our internal uh, financial targets that we need to achieve. But if you plan it in the right way, and if you say, this route took me 12 days before, and now it's going to take uh, 14 or 16 days. You just plan to hit that particular target and drive the product to the time that you need on the lane that you need. So I, I see them all going really hand in hand, the, the re redesigning of the supply chain with the new tools uh, that are available. We can be much more creative. We don't need to wait for the customer order. I mean, there, there were different discussion about the price overall doesn't make a difference. Maybe in some cases, in some product, it doesn't. But for other products, and, and look at this, and it's probably more in the container uh, shipping world, the decision of where to purchase the product will, will depend on competitiveness of landed product. And 
where you're not localizing by default, you go to locals countries, probably the impact will be lower, but it needs to be calculated. But again, this is again a part of total supply chain cost, total supply chain lead time, total supply chain service, total supply chain sustainability index. And all those are really a part of the KPIs that we have in our supply chain. Thank you, Joe. Um, Adair, I'm actually going to ask you a question and, and you can answer, you can follow up to that as well. Um, you know, based on what, what we've just been discussing, it's very clear or it, it may appear that um, industry is far more committed um, than some governments are. So to to Magda's point about nudging, how do you, how do you nudge um, governments and more broadly the IMO? Okay, well, let me, let me start with that because I wanted to comment on that when Craig was talking about it. Um, I think the IMO achieved a, an extraordinary uh, progress in, in the 2010s, and Magda said it earlier. I mean, you know, if you'd gone back 10 years ago and said the IMO is going to have a 50% reduction target by 2050, people would have been amazed by that. Now, of course, we've seen the same in lots of other sectors as well. If you'd have told people two years ago that China was going to be committing to be zero carbon by 2060, and that Bao Wu Steel, the biggest Chinese steel manufacturer, was then going to commit to be zero carbon by 2050, people would have been amazed by that. And of course, what has happened is a gradual growth of the belief that we've got to solve this problem, but also a gradual realization that some of the technologies are coming through that make this cheaper to deal with. Well, you know, one of the big things that's happening over the last couple of years is that we're realizing that with cheap renewable electricity, we can now drive, drive down the cost of green hydrogen. So at the moment, making hydrogen from electrolysis costs five or six dollars per kilogram. There are lots of people out there with credible projects who say that within five to 10 years, they will be producing green hydrogen at less than $2 a kilogram or $1.5 a kilogram. And they're able to do that because the cost of the electrolyzers are coming down, the cost of the renewable electricity is coming down. So in part, what's happening is across all sectors of the economy, a set of enabling technologies are collapsing in price, which are making it possible for people to say, I'm going to get to zero carbon in a way that they wouldn't before. But the political framework is incredibly important. I think the IMO did a major step forward. And I think what's really interesting is they managed to make that step forward despite having America there under the Donald Trump system uh, because they have a majority voting system, uh, which means that they can ignore uh, small countries, no, small numbers of countries, uh, even if those countries are rather big. You don't need unanimity at IMO. Um, but I do think that with America now back in global climate, let's take advantage of these next four years. We want America in IMO now being not a drag anchor against activity, but arguing for more ambitious activity. And it's why I said within the international diplomacy, which often focuses on what our country um, mid-century targets, what our country NDCs within themselves, this whole issue of how much progress are we going to make in IMO and ICAO to drive aviation and shipping, I think should be an important focus at COP26 as well. And I hope there will be a lot of political pressure. But countries, are, IMO is also nudged. It's also nudged by, by companies saying, we can do it. We can get to net zero by 2050. Why can't the IMO do it? And it's also nudged by individual countries saying, uh, or jurisdictions such as the EU saying, we're going to take action with our uh, domestic emissions. We're going to take action in our own ports ahead of what we want. And all of that are, are different ways to nudge, uh, nudge the IMO. I just wanted to comment on this point about the, the price and the, the cost of extra freight. And this is a really important point that we get across a number of sectors where they, it is unlikely that there is a zero cost way to decarbonizing either steel or cement or uh, shipping. So in all likelihood, if we have zero carbon, steel, cement and shipping in 2050, the cost of a ton of steel, a ton of cement, or a given freight rate of, from X to Y 
will be higher than it would otherwise be. And of course, that means that for the individual buyer of that ton of steel, that ton of cement, or that particular ship uh, charter, uh, that cargo, um, they have a major problem. Um, you know, they will want the lowest price uh, available. And it means that it's very difficult for one a, a company to go ahead with decarbonization if they're not confident that their competitors are going to do the same. But that high cost at the business to business level is combined with the fact that when you take it through to the end consumer, what it does to the cost of the products which end consumers buy for steel and cement and shipping, it's relatively trivial. And for instance, it's completely different from the challenges of decarbonizing residential heat, where if it costs more to decarbonize residential heat, you do something non-trivial to end consumer budgets. With steel and cement and shipping, you can take quite a lot of cost at the wholesale business to business level and consumers are no worse off. And that just defines the coordination problem. Those, therefore, are the sectors where we have to find the way, the regulation or carbon pricing, to force the whole industry simultaneously to decarbonize so that each responsible company that wants to decarbonize can do it without being undercut by competitors. That's a, that's a generic challenge that we have in a small number of sectors which are both internationally traded and which have a high cost of decarbonization at the business to business level, but a very low impact of those extra costs down at the consumer level. Thank you. Magda, very quickly, if you could just tell us um, how, the, how a body like the EU can help other states commit uh, to similar targets to yours. Um, thank you. I think, um, well, w one easy way for us, but maybe not so easy for everybody, is this lead by example and show that it's possible. Because as I said at the beginning, we have quite a complex uh, and uh, elaborate system of pieces of legislation that will be coming at the European level, addressing different parts of the entire economy to make sure that every sector contributes to the decarbonization target. But, uh, but of course, it is, it is not everything because by, by imposing requirements at the, at the EU level, we also need to make sure that we work with others to, to, to support them to reach to a similar level of ambition. And here we could probably spend another hour or two discussing a European Union international aid programs, working with developing countries, putting a special focus in any budget that EU is spending on targets related to decarbonization or green deal or greening of the economy on the whole. And I think we should really be... Um, true to what we preach um, in the in the next financial fi financial perspective in the next seven year budget of the EU we are committed to spend at least 37 percent of the budget to target and to topics uh, and to investments that will clearly push for the greening um, for, for, for the greening objective and that spending does not only relate to investments that will be done in the EU but that will also be translated to all the to all the international um, dimension and all the international aid programs and so on and so forth we will also be pursuing uh, the objective of, of decarbonization or green greening and sustainability in international agreements in in FTAs free trade agreements and so on and so forth but uh, um, uh, I, I would just like to come back to this, to this, to this multilateralism. In the in the last couple of weeks, uh, European Commission came up with a new document, actually reconfirming how important in the current global world is the multilateral approach. IMO and ICAO are mentioned uh, explicitly in the context uh, of decarbonization of shipping and aviation, but that also speaks for the for the other international international organisations, even the ones which at face value do not seem directly related to, to, to international uh, environmental and climate uh, policies. And I think uh, being uh, a body representing a 
developed part of the world, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to demonstrate that things are possible, but we also have this, uh, this responsibility to make sure that everybody is on board and that nobody is left behind. Thank you. Thank you. So just as in, in very few words, if you could each just say, um, if you could share one piece of advice to the audience, um, what would it be, Craig? Do I get three? You, you get mean, three words. Like <laughs> we look at it like this, and I'll be brief. Uh, I think we've, co we've concluded as such, but we believe technology is available to bring us the fuels that we need for the future. We believe that we can resolve the supply chain challenges and we believe that it's affordable. So with those, with those uh, aspects that put aside and, and believing that we can make this happen, uh, fundamentally, as far as we're concerned, what we need is a much more ambitious regulation. We need a level playing field and we've no time to waste. I think the points about starting in the, 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 the early 20s now uh, we, we hit the magic clock this year. Any ship we build from today onwards will still be around sailing in 2050. So we need speed. Uh, very briefly, we only have a few minutes left. Can you hear me? Sorry, Dave, if you want to... Oh, sorry, sorry, I thought you were going to go. Um, look, I just agree entirely with what Craig said, and I find it very difficult to add to that. I guess I would add, you know, be ambitious, be confident that we have the technologies that it's doable. Uh, let's have aim for the tougher regulation still, clear level playing field. But I would say we also need to say to the shipping industry, really, any ship that you are buying, you know, beyond 2022, 2023, has got to be compatible with getting to a zero carbon target. I don't think we can spend the whole of the 2020s debating what the technologies are. I think we've got to have a debate which within two or three years is actually meaning that new ships coming in then are definitively capable of being zero carbon. And I think that is possible. I mean, I think Maersk has just said that they will be uh, bringing a, a, a methanol-based uh, a ship into service. I think it's from 2023, or at least starting to build it then. So I think this is possible. I think we can accelerate that. And given that ships last for 30 years, we have got to be really within one or two years actually building the new fleet, which is capable of being zero carbon. Draw, thank you. Do you, draw, do you want to add anything to that? Absolutely. Go as fast as possible and make it happen. Thank you. Magda? Thank you. I think for the energy transition, we need two things. We need less energy and we need cleaner energy. And for both of those objectives, we need a, a, a predictable regulatory pathway. But in order to really make a sector different, we also need to transform how the sector operates. We need to have it better connected. We need to have different uh, business models. We need to have probably a slightly different uh, supply chain. And we need to make sure that we use all technologies, which are then not only only the ones related to, to energy, but also the ones related to communications. So with that, all I can say is maybe we should look up more to the sky and to make sure that the information and data that is flowing from all the sensors and satellites which are there will be now used to navigate shipping into this bright, carbon-free and definitely sustainable future that I'm sure is ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you um, for a for a very interesting and informative discussion. Um, I think it's, you know, based on what we were just discussing, technology is obviously paramount to, um, to achieving these targets. And, and in fact, we're, we're not being ambitious enough. Um, and I think, you know, all of you have, have alluded to that. Um, and, and so I want to thank you for all, your, uh, all of you for your time. And um, I'd like to also encourage our delegates to visit the um, ocean.economist.com, our brand new World Ocean Initiative website, um, which features news and articles about the sustainable blue economy. Thank you all once again. Thank you very much.